Hello and welcome to the Week in Review. You're watching QTV. I'm your host, Adi Darami, and I always tell you that I have a special guest, somebody who's going to go through some of the stories with me. This week is no, uh, it's, 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 it's absolutely true, and somebody I've been looking forward to. We've exchanged emails over the time, but we've never met until today. Mustafa Sisei, welcome to the program. Thank you very much, Mr. Adrami. It's a pleasure to be on the show. Thanks, and, and as I said, thanks for coming. And uh, you know how it is, you know, you've been here over a year, you're exchanging emails, but you never meet people, even though Gambia is a small country. If you're joining us for the first time, this is how the show works. Uh, we go through 10 stories that have kind of taken my fancy during the week, and myself and my guests look at them in detail. So uh, as they say, without further ado, let's get on with the show. First story is something that very, very passionate and dear to my heart, and it's about road traffic accidents, specifically remembrance of road traffic victims. Have a look at this clip and you'll get more of a sense of what I'm talking about. You need to have safe road users. Who are these road users? You need to have, of course, people who are, you, you know, you have to cater for people who are working. So therefore, what WHO says on the United Nations, the road must, have, must accommodate the pedestrians. Because nearly over half of the road traffic crashes or the deaths are among three vulnerable, vulnerable users. There you have uh, someone talking about you need to have safe road users. Now, this is something which, uh, of course, um, if you live and work in the Gambia, is something that you'll be uh, very, very much aware of, um, the sort of lack of safety uh, that there is. Uh, Mustafa, um, as I said before I introduced that clip, I said this is something that's very dear to my heart. People know that I've complained about poor traffic management and, and, and manners in, in road manners in the Gambia. Uh, what's been your experience? And, and really, if we go back to the specific about the Remembrance Day, uh, you know, how seriously are we taking something like this when we have such a day? Thank you very much. I start with my experience uh, as a road user. I, I, am, I am always not comfortable regarding uh, using road in the Gambia here, right. depending on, on the, the behavior of drivers and, and certain players in the field. Sure. For instance, I live in an area where crossing the road has no <laughs> indication of drivers to slow down or to allow people to cross. Sometimes you can stay there for minutes without being able to cross because of the heavy traffic. Sure. So my experience with this is something that's not good, and I think it's something that we should improve. It is not something that we are taking it seriously. Maybe in other areas, but places like far out or down the road, sure. sometimes it's very difficult for children to cross the road. Elders as well. Mm -hmm. Myself, sometimes it takes me a long time before I'm able to cross from the other side of the road to the other side of the road in order to embark on my daily business. Uh, well, I'm glad yeah. you said that because, um, you know, I, I mentioned the article I wrote, which, you know, some people might, may have read and seen online. It was for the BBC, and it was about this. And I made the joke there, but, but it's a serious matter. I said, you know, I, I'm surprised Gambia doesn't have people who can run faster than Usain Bolt. <laughs> uh, because people don't stop for you. Uh, and so uh, this uh, day that was being commemorated was remembrance for victims. And it mentioned, you know, you know road users being the most uh, common victims uh, of, of accidents. Uh, and you've just given us an example there of the sort of thing. And, you know, the question I was really getting at is that, and you've said it uh, in, in passing that we don't take it seriously. What needs to happen for us to take it seriously? Yeah, there are so many things, uh, you know, the various players. First of all, I think it's very important to raise the awareness of the road users, uh -huh. especially uh, road users, and the importance of using the road effectively. Sure, sure. When I say effectively, some of, often a time I will be by the road or in a vehicle and someone will cross in front of a driver and then I will hear drivers say, in our local dialect, you want to die. <laughs> That's something that always shock me now. So they have to be, we have people, we have to raise their awareness. Mm -hmm. Who supposed to raise this at the authorities? Mm -hmm. Everyone, the awareness of the road, road users have to be raised. Otherwise, mm -hmm. they will not take the road user, or they will not make effective use of the road. Mm -hmm. Take for instance, if a driver is driving and sees a child from nursery school trying to cross the road, no one should tell the driver to stop. Yeah, so the, if only the, the awareness of the drivers are raised that People using the road are equally important, are even much more important than the vehicles. Sure. So this is something that is going to go a long way in enhancing and avoiding the 
accidents. The other side of it has to be the attitude of road users. Yes. I wouldn't say more of drivers, but sometimes yes, individuals, yes. you have to be very cautious before you cross the road. Mm -hmm. I told you it takes me some minutes before I cross the road. Right, yes. I, I didn't come and bump myself onto the road. No, you have to make sure that our attitudes, road users, is in line with standards. First of all, when you come before you cross the road, you have to look to the left, sure. to the right, and see and ensure it is safe for you to cross. Yes. Then you can go. For the drivers as well, it is very important. Life matters more than any other thing now. Sure. Even if road users are not careful in the way they use the road, they happen to cross when drivers are coming, people should try to avoid them. Sure. Like I said, comments like you want to die, then I've got there, you left the fire. So those are things that are not supposed to be said. No, no one wants to die. Also attitude, and first of all, we start with awareness raising, and also that will lead to change of attitude in terms of road using. And I am sure if that happens now, there is going to be less accidents or road incidents as we'd, we experience now. Uh, and, you know, um, knowing that I was going to be doing this show and knowing that this was going to be the first item, as I was driving to work this morning, <laughs> you know, things happened that made me smile. I thought, oh, this is almost kind of feeding into the, the, the piece that we're going to be discussing because one of the things that happened was that uh, cars were beeping at me because I stopped at a red traffic light to give way to the ones who had green. I mean, the ones behind me were beeping, beeping, and the ones in front of me, they were, the, the light was red long before they got there. They just went through the light, totally ignored it. And the other thing was when I stopped at certain points to allow people to cross the road, the drivers behind started honking their horns at me. And I'm thinking, if I don't stop and nobody stops, when is somebody going to stop for people to cross the road? Is this something we need to teach from school age up? I mean, in the UK, they have, you know, they teach pe children about the Green Cross Code which is about you know, your, your manners, either as a pedestrian or as a driver. Do we teach this? Um, because I don't know. And, and if not, why don't we teach it? Yeah, it, it's very important, like you say. Uh, I think it's, very, it's been taught at school. I used to be a teacher sometimes right. ago. I ceased okay. being a teacher in 2016. From 20, 2008 yeah. to 2016, I used to be a teacher, more right. often of a primary school teacher. Right. Uh, at, uh, if, I, if, if I could fully remember uh, in grade three, Mm -hmm. is you have, there is a topic on road science. Right. So these are taught at schools. I do not know whether they are taught at upper basic schools, mm -hmm. at senior secondary schools, at college, but they are taught at lower basic school. Mm -hmm. Maybe there should be a way, a, a way in which it will be taught to make sure that children from school have this in mind, that sure. in a way to have this in mind that when I am to use the road, I should use it in this way, I should not use it in that way. Sure. And the other time, the other thing has to be you saying that you stop in and you have drivers behind you honing. This, is, this has to do with attitudes. Right. It was on Wednesday that myself and um, my colleague at work went to Banjul. We went to PMO. So we, the, our vehicle was just picking something. Those behind me are very impatient. They started honing, 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 honing. Sure. So he said, I talked to her, I said, hey, you, you've heard the people. As he said, they are just impatient, don't mind. That's so people true. have to be enlightened sure. as to when and how we should react on the road. I, sometimes I argue as to the importance of oh, the, 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 the effectiveness of the current driving license and before. Sure. Before you have road signs there. Yeah, that's right. Yes, even I, who was never a driver, would be able to look at it and see. But now, you just have it that. I will not argue, you know, the importance of but in terms of enlightenment, the other one enlightens people more than this. Sure. Because you are told that this is a sign of bumpy road. Yes. You are told that this is a, you know, a, a no U-turn. You are told this is that, if the, but on the current one, it's not there. And a lot of people who drive on the road definitely have to be enlightened on the best way to use the road. I think and that's a brilliant point. School. <laughs> yes, yes. I yeah. think that's a brilliant point to end yeah. on that. Because otherwise, <laughs> honestly, I could do a two hour program on this, uh, but we don't have time for that. Uh, but thanks for that, Mustafa. It's a pleasure. Uh, but I think it's a great point to end on that. You know, people have to be enlightened. And now uh, on to something else, which is also to do with roads, but slightly different. In fact, completely different from what we've just been discussing. Have a look at this clip and you'll get a sense of what I'm talking about. The 86 kilometer project is fully government funded at an estimated $1.6 billion and will last one year, four months. The lot project is divided into two lots. Lot 1 is a 38 kilometer road linking Saba Sukuto to Bambali, Sara Kuna to Ngen Sanjal, and is awarded to RSK Construction Company Limited. Lot 2 is awarded to CSA Company, a Senegalese company covering Kauto Jimbala, Kauto Ker Ulde, and Kauto Gyane Kuna to the Senegalese border village of Ker Chendu. A total distance of 48 kilometers. And I confess I'm not picking on anybody every time I feature these sorts of things that um, 
you know, yet another foundation stone is being laid for yet another road. Um, and I always refer people back to uh, former Ghanaian president Kwame Nkrumah. Um, there's this, I'm not sure how true the story is, but at the time John F. Kennedy was saying that America would at some point land a man on the moon, um, he was saying that, isn't it amazing? America is planning to put a man on the moon and we're still struggling to get from our towns and cities to our home villages because our roads are so bad. He said that around 1962. <laughs> I, we look at that. I mean, uh, you know, progress in any country cannot move surely without decent infrastructure, including especially roads. Uh, what's been your experience of sort of traveling from away from the urban into the rural areas? Yes, uh, it's interesting and, and <laughs> coincidentally I am from this area. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. uh, you know, the other people from the other side of the country will tell us that you from the north yeah, yeah. you run when going and <laughs> you run when coming. We start at the ferry. Yeah. But um, uh, it's, it's, it's sort of a positive one, mm. uh, driving from, let's say, Farafini to, to, to my yeah, area. It's sort of a positive one. So my experience has always been, first, we start with the vehicles. Mm -hmm. I, I, I have thought about this uh, in terms of vehicle policies or, you know, the capacities of vehicles. Yes. Yeah. You know, the, ru the law is one in the, in the urban and then rural gambia. When it comes to implementation, yeah. I'm surprised it's different. Yeah, yes. Uh, you see a seed, uh, you know, a, a seed which is designated for three here, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, will be more than three yeah, yeah, of in, the, in, the, in the rural Gambia. And if you complain, they will tell you uh, you are not from this area. So my experience in terms of, and in, in terms of road infrastructure, yeah. I think the urban area benefits more yeah, than the rural yeah. area. And the rural area also pay tax as yeah, the yeah, urban area do. Yes. So by looking at this, this is a mi an important milestone for people of Sabah Sanjal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's an important milestone. Though it has some, you know, brought some mixed reactions among them, we will come to that. Yeah, but yeah. first of all, it is an important milestone because it's going to boost the infrastructural phase of the well area. this is it, yes. Yeah, yes. so that's, that's, that's a matter of, that's something for it's going to boost. So because, because from the location like Sabah Sukuro, you drive from Farafeni, a little bit just before Ngien Sanjal, there is a village called Sabah Sukuro. The road is almost abandoned right. because of the bad right. condition. Yeah, yeah. So people behind there have to resolve to use it another way, another different way yeah. Now, when this is constructed now to Sarakunda, then to Bambal, mm. to Ngen, it is going to ease community. It is going to be ease, easy movement. It's going to ease movement of goods and services in that area. Okay. And it, it may bring about boost in terms of commerce yeah, because of you course. have people who want to establish certain commercial well, centers. Well, right. But because of the bad roads, you know, when they think of you know, transporting certain commodities from the, where there are suppliers in Farafeni okay. to that place, they think of damages and other well, stuff like right. that, and they don't want to go ahead. Yes, and it's going also going to, but it has put something, some, some, some villages to a disadvantage. Interesting. Well, I, I was going to say, because yes. you, you mentioned yeah. that there, it, not everybody is going to be advantaged yeah, exactly. by it. Somebody, That's why some people are going to, to be disadvantaged. Some people by are so, yeah. disadvantaged by it. You have, because yes. when you, let's say, when you get from Sapa Sukoto yes. to, to Njabo, that this, is just, this, this development is it's like a T, yeah. T road, yeah. from right. Sapa Sukoto. Then you have a tiro. One goes to Sarakuna, to Bamba, yes, then to the Gen. Yes. But yeah, if it had continued, so it would have gone to past two villages to a war fora, right. which was one time functioning according to its history. Right. There's a wharf ahead. Uh -huh. You have the two Kanikundas. You have the Kanikunda Suba and you have the Kanikunda Tender. Right. And the wharf now connects the, the NBR, that end of NBR, to uh -huh. the CRR, the people uh -huh. in the Nyamiras. Now, if that road is constructed, it's going to boost connectivity between the people in CRR of that end sure. and the people in the NBR. Well, I hope government are watching because uh, yes. maybe this is something for the future. Yeah, and yeah. interestingly, you have people, you have two people, prominent people of this of the current government are from that area. Yeah, right. One of the current advisors of the government is from the, from the village that I'm talking about, about the road project, uh, according to the paper, yeah. has not extended to that place. Oh. And if that road is constructed now, why it is going to boost trade in that area, but the failure of constructing it is going to put them to a lot of disadvantage. One, mm -hmm. because I've experienced on many occasions when I travel from far away to my village, then they, they will say we will not reach to your village because of the road, because the poor of condition. Yeah. Now, if this place is the if this place is tarred already, sure. where initially it was not tarred, it's just a red gravel, they don't want to go beyond. Now, when it is tarred, they will insist more, and the people there will be put to a disadvantage until. That part of the road, less than five kilometers, is constructed. So we urge the government to look into that. I think, again, a good point to end on that. <laughs> we urge the government to look into that. And uh, my advice to all of them is that, please, if you're building these roads, 
build them well. There are also really poorly constructed roads in this country. In fact, th they're dreadful. And really, yeah, I, I hope <laughs> that uh, the roads that we're building for the future are for a long time. Uh, now on to another one, and this story uh, was one of uh, several that actually shocked me. There's another one coming in later in, uh, in the program. And this one was to do with uh, uh, the Gambia College, the Basse Annex. Uh, have a look at this. Reports that the college is on the verge of closure due to staff shortage have raised eyebrows. QTV visited the school to ascertain the facts. Mine were amongst the eyebrows that were raised when we heard that story, Mustafa, because um, when we uh, did a story about the launching of the college, I thought it was nice, bright, shiny and new, and it looked great. Uh, but I think you have first-hand knowledge of the fact that actually uh, there are major problems at that college annex. Yes, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Drame, it's very interesting uh, looking at such a, a magnificent edifice. Yeah. And then you hear a story of uh, it being threatened to shut down because of certain facilities or lack of certain uh, necessities that you call it. So we start with, uh, uh, if you look at the Gambia education policy, mm. 2016 to 2030, both ministries em envisage accessible, quality, and inclusive education yeah. for sustainable development. development. Yes. So this more fast contrast that. I mean, you just said the magic word there because, uh, and one of the reasons why I chose this particular story, first of all, because education is something that I, I, f I believe passionately in. And I think that any country for it to develop has to have a, a sort of functioning education system. Um, but, the, you know, we, we need to talk about sustainability. It's all very well having a beautiful building there, uh, but you've got not enough uh, facilities to run it and you don't have, crucially, the staff to run it, or certainly the quality staff to run it. Yes, sir. <laughs> so, uh, Mr. Trump, I would say, you know, the Gambia College has been neglected mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. by prob probably all, all, all governments of the day. Yeah. I was not an adult in the time of the First Republic, yeah. you know, and I witnessed the Second Republic, and we're still in the Second Republic, the second leader under the Second Absolutely. Republic. The Gambia College is neglected. Mm -hmm. The Gambia College, considering its contribution towards the socio-economic development of the country in the area of providing education to people or to students sure. or to citizens of this country. You, and then compared to the facility, the standard of, mm. of the Gambia College, you realize that it is neglected. Sure. In terms of sanitation, you have dilapidated sure, facility. Sure. In terms of, you have lecture, lecture, you have students over the years have been complaining. Staff welfare, that's zero. I personally have covered three different staff strike, two at least two strikes at by the staff course. in the previous years wow. at the main. Right, so right, when right. the head has a problem, mm -hmm. <laughs> the entire part of the body is affected. Of so coming down to this annex now, the main Gambia College campus has a lot of facilities. Sure. So you don't expect, it's not a surprise for me having this complaint from the annex. annex. And if the annex is threatened, this potential you know, close -over, if actually it goes ahead, it is going to cause you know, irre irreparable damage indeed, indeed. to the country because we believe that education is one of the key or the tool to development. Sure. So if people who are supposed to impart education into our young ones you know, are not taking care or do not get the facilities sure. in order to go ahead until the place close, one of the reasons is to make sure that I am in the combos here, not because I chose to be in the combos. I am compelled because to be in the combos because, because when I wanted to go to the college, there was no college in my area. So now, now that we have a college in the area, it is going to cost uh, quite a lot of cost for people to come over here and spend. It is going to ease them to access education now. Why not the government provide? The government should have cut expenses on these useless travels that they don't that they do, sure. traveling all the way sure. to be just to lay a foundation stone sure. of a project. It's a waste of public fund. You could have delegated a governor or any other stakeholder of the government in that region to do that once, some, even Alcalos of various regions could do that and let them cut those funds and put it on something else rather than doing it. So the Gambia College deserves better. I think, I think that's a, a great point. The Gambia College deserves better. And uh, I think at this point, let's take a quick uh, commercial break. And when we come back, uh, we've got some more stories. So uh, don't go away. <laughs>
Welcome back from that uh, quick commercial break. And uh, just before the break there, we were talking about the uh, Basse College Annex and the problems that they're having. Now, um, something that I think is going to be dear to the uh, minds and hearts of myself and Mustafa, and that's about the International Day to End Impunity for Crimes Against Journalists. There was a march that was organized. Have a look at this clip. We want the Office of the President to resume the regular press briefing that they used to have. Of course, we must comment at this point the resumption of the press briefing by the Minister of Information. The Minister of Information recognizes prevailing issues of abuse against the media, highlighted by the Gambia Press Union, but also argues that the cases were never state sanctioned and that the government encourages full investigations into the matter. Now, uh, the key recommendations I mean, uh, from your report I mean, uh, will be studied. We will uh, look at them critically. Um, the issue of uh, presidential press conferences, I think this is a matter of uh, time. Hopefully, I mean, uh, we will also would like to see these things happen. And uh, because at the end of the day, I mean, uh, you have an open government that wants to ensure that, you know, we engage you people. We want this bad blood. Wants to engage. Um, did you take part in that? March, by no, the way? I, I had lecture from 11 to <laughs> okay. the starting time of the, 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 the uh, March. So what I about the day department. itself, um, you know, to end impunity for crimes against journalists? Uh, and we heard, I mean, one of the statistics that was broadcast was the fact that even under this sort of more benign uh, regime that we have, there have been at least 13 incidents here in the Gambia. But what's been your experience having been in the uh, trade for a much longer time? Uh, yes, uh, my experience uh, in it way is not a positive one. I told, like I told you in a chit chat, I started being harassed as a journalist at the Gambi College. Oh when I was at the Gambi College, that was, that, was, that was when I started being harassed as the editor in chief of the press club. You imagine? <laughs> so then, Jamie had you know agents at the Gambi College who were doing the same course as, sure. and then they were feeding the information, you know, feeding the. Uh, the principal information, the principal myself had to suspend me for a year because of my activities as a press member. And okay. So I never went on bar. So I, I made sure I completed my teaching career and also okay. pick up my career as a journalist. So uh, I mean, so uh, what's been your experience in terms of the improvement? We're all talking about there's been an improvement in, and there's been a vast improvement, hasn't there? Yeah, initially there's been a little improvement, but the rest is just a mere lip service. Mm -hmm. Because it before when the president came, President Barrow came, President Barrow came as a result of the massive enlightenment that the media embarked on. People sure. realized that they could okay vote in and vote out power. Sure. So when they came to know about a true media enlightenment, they voted out mm -hmm. Jame and then voted in President Barrow. When he came initially, you know, the marriage was, you know, the honeymoon went well. Yeah. But after all, like uh, it has been alluded in the old well, well, that's right. I mean, in that segment there, we just heard them saying that when he came initially, he used to have these briefings with the media. I mean, you go to America, you see Barack Obama facing the, the press every week or whoever the president of, of, of America happens to be, Trump, of course, and, and in, in, in the UK, Boris Johnson, similarly. Why do you think it was stopped? Yeah, for many reasons, because, you know, if you, are, if you are not comfortable with what you do, you always fear criticism. Mm -hmm. So I believe the president and those around him are not comfortable with what they do. If they are actually transparent, why hiding behind the clouds? Actually, I am not afraid to face the media on whatever they call me. You've called me just yesterday. Sure. I hear I am. I'm clean. So I am sure the president is not doing well. And he will want the media to spot out those errors. That's why. Sure. And one of the things I will tell him, let him not be offended by criticism. Critics are very positive in, in building someone's well, life. Well, that's right. I mean, and I think that's a great point that uh, Mustafa has just made there. And I think it's a point that many uh, uh, sort of politicians miss out on. They think that be, you're criticizing them because you don't like them. But actually, it's good to have criticism because you can't just surround yourself with, with people telling you how wonderful you are. So, um, you know, please listen to criticism. Uh, now, on to something else. Uh, and this is about uh, Gambia getting a very good score from an international body. Who am I talking about? Millennium Corporation. Have a look at this. Have out of the 20 indicators, I believe we have at least 12, all green and in very high scores. And indicatively, we have scored past in control of corruption, democratic rights, and have scorecard. Uh, we have passed in almost all the scorecards. We are having a setback on the uh, one are some aspects of the economic freedom, which is under fiscal policy, and we all understand that this is a policy environment that they are working on. At the same time, also, the issue of land rights and access is also where we have not scored very well. The health expenditure uh, also is not, was not uh, very good, 
what there is progress. Millennium Challenge Corporation there uh, giving its scorecard for the Gambia. And uh, as I said before the break there, um, now this isn't just a kind of tick box exercise. Uh, and the importance of it is because the countries that score highly um, actually benefit from grants and loans and that sort of thing uh, because people look at the scorecard and because it's from such a reputable uh, organization. Um, uh, but I was interested there that one of the ones where this score is quite low, education and health. Uh, does that surprise you or not? Uh, it's something that doesn't surprise me because bearing in mind how Gamble College was treated, how it has been treated by, by, by the various governments that yeah. I've mentioned, sure. and then the health has been grappling with the constraint that the health system has been grappling with. Indeed. This is not a surprise for me. Yeah. Mm. I mean, uh, one of the things that uh, I found particularly interesting is that uh, we're talking about the Gambia College and now again that scorecard and education on that scorecard, mm. is that successive governments have always made a lot of noise about how important they take education. <laughs> But the evidence is not there that <laughs> they, they take it with the same seriousness that they should. So, yeah, Adi, yeah, first <laughs> of all, I have an issue with it. This is uh, a credible body, yes. but I understand that it has board of directors which conduct this through uh, information that they collected from Freedom from House. And that's right. Yeah, so, that's correct. you know, most of those uh, you know, investigative firms or whatever you may call them get their information to recite. The people that they contact might be people, sure. might, might not be the right people. Yeah. So, I have a board with it. This, if you look at the score, 12, you know, out of 20. Yeah. It's a margin. It's, 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 it's a lost score. Yeah. So this is something that the Gambia government should not be proud of. Sure. For me, if you are proud of, you know, this score and you have your education system, you know, it's dilapidated. Mm -hmm. You have your health system. Actually, these are people who do not treat themselves. They treat themselves overseas. It's so they will be proud of. But as for someone who believes in the system, this is actually not something not to be proud of for me as a Gambian citizen, mm -hmm. because it has shown that two key areas that the government claim to have respected are not respected. Quite. Look at the president. How many times have we seen him, have we seen him tweeted about, about health mm -hmm. and tweeted about education? Very minimal. Mm -hmm. So that shows that he is not serious with these two sectors. Mm -hmm. I don't mind letting them come with press release because that's what they do. Yeah, yeah. But he is not serious looking at what is obtained on the ground. Sure. Gambia College is more than 60 years. Mm -hmm. Look at Gambia College. Then. And then of now we should be talking of Gambia College generating or being self-sustaining to its own initiative by being empowered by it. Sure. the government, but that's not been done. How many times have we seen students strike here? How many times have we seen teachers strike because their salaries have not been paid or they have been deli delayed? How many times have we seen health personnel? Recently, mm -hmm. we've seen health personnel striking. That's you think right. they are striking for the sake of striking? No, they are pushed to the corner. Mm -hmm. So these are things that should tell us that this is something that, in my own opinion, is something that should not, one should not be proud of. Actually, yeah. I am not proud of it, not because I am jealous, but because I know what's obtained. Mm -hmm. I was at Jami Foundation for some, some time ago. I've seen what the health sector, what the personnel they are grappling with. Sure. I went to see someone there. I've been there the whole day. I've seen how they are managing. It's definitely not to my pleasure seeing them struggling in those conditions. Yet they smile. Sure. Yes. And uh, I think it's good that you said that because um, the next uh, clip that we're going to see actually leads beautifully on from what we've just been talking about, uh, the kind of uh, interest in health, in education and so on, and the seriousness with which we teach this, yeah. uh, we're, that we put towards these things that we talk about. And, and I think uh, we should probably spend a bit more time on this one because of that. So please, have a look at this clip, and it's to do with the WASKE results that have come out this past week. Have a look. We want to make sure that our curriculum is digitalized and when that is done the students will have access to the curriculum they will be able to interact with the curriculum as opposed to just going to school uh, after class no more access to lessons or so on <clears throat> in addition again is the uh, the thing i have said earlier on is the provision of sd cards these sd cards will have the entire syllabus from grade seven to eight so that gives them an opportunity to to engage themselves and interact with that uh, now i i don't want people to think that we spend this whole program bashing government um but uh, said before that story there and when we're talking about the other story uh that you know there's a lot of talk about how seriously they take education 
Now, if you look at the bold statistics, uh, students who got uh, five or more, uh, you know, yeah. part, you know, credits, uh, uh, five or above, between five and nine, uh, there were eight only 85 more students in the total of the thousands than last year uh, that got five or more. And that's hardly something to sing and dance or shout about, surely. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yes, you know, I, I, I was <laughs> talking about what I saw at the hospital now that we come into <laughs> I saw at the hospital two patients shared in one bed. So that's for me. But Actually, I saw it mm. by two decade eyes, like wow. Hitler will say. It's a common practice in many hospitals across the country. Let's go to the education system. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm I've seen it's 79 percent of you know the students score less than five credits. Yeah, right. So and it and the government is is is, is, is singing that you know performance at this level is a slight well. improvement. They called it. Yeah, but, but slight but improvement. Th that's that's uh, it's minuscule, surely. Yeah. So this is a slight. No, I wouldn't, this is uh, it's it's although it's uh, an improvement, but very slight. So if you have 79% of students score less than five credit, mm -mm. so this is something that has to be looked into. Uh, what does that say about preparing students for the future? We talk about the importance of education in national development. Yeah. Uh, don't we see that if we don't put the resources into, I mean, we've shown some of the schools here on QTV. I wouldn't send my dog to some of them. They're, they're in a shocking state. How can anybody be in that uh, uh, place, in that condition, and learn, uh, you know, it's not conducive to learning. Yeah, you know, well, well, I, I have an advantage when I, uh, as a journalist when it comes to, to talking about educational issues because I had been a teacher. Yeah. I as know what's said. required in a classroom, mm -hmm. in a learning situation. Mm -hmm. I know it. So when it is lacking, I know it's straight away. Mm -hmm. I remember going to the ministry, uh, MAPSE, when they were launching their, you know, uh, communications unit. So I, I told them that I was one time a teacher. So let's away from that. It was, uh, it's very simple to gauge mm -hmm. whether or not a particular government aims high to improve the socioeconomic development of its country or not. Mm -hmm. I will tell you two things. Mm -hmm. First, we've talked about infrastructure. Every development either passes on the road, sea, or flies over. Sure. So this three has to be well taken care of. The other thing is education. Whatever you do, you need a prior knowledge. You need knowledge to make sure that that thing succeeds now. Sure. So this education, if you go to certain schools, you know, the PS is talking about digitalizing education. That's okay. The, the curriculum, rather, to digitalize the curriculum. Made now. me smile. When I, I wonder that. if yeah. you digitalize curriculum, somebody, so a child who is, whose parents are not able to buy him or her an exercise book, I would deposit access gadget that would be used to make sure you get on are. that. Right. So this is something that we, we might want to make a copy of, you know, or to replicate what's going on in other countries. I, I, I'm glad you mentioned that because <laughs> actually that's the point I was about to make, yes. is that are we just saying these things because we know that this is what happens in other countries and yet we're not anywhere near being prepared for them? Yes, I have a friend who usually tells me, Mustafa, is a comparison doesn't work in all, in, all, in all sections. I said, yes. You might want to imitate some doesn't work in all sections. Yeah. You might want to imitate what's in Sierra Leone. Yeah, but finally, what you need to do first is now, what has it taken in that particular country to implement that? Sure. I what mean, as you and I place? speak, yeah. um, in uh, New York, this very week, yeah. they've announced a total school closure yes, for at least a minute. month. Yeah. And in making the announcement, they said from here on, for the whole of this month, all the 300,000 students, 300,000 students, will be taught at home remotely. They can do that there. They can talk about digital, they can talk about remote learning, but we're not nowhere near that. And you've just made the point. If your parents can't afford the gadget that you're going to uh, put in your SD card, as was said there, what's the point of having SD cards? It's just probably to come off like the situation and then the, the you know, outside partners to tell them, fine, we've done this. But in the real sense, we mm. need to put in play, we need to initiate what is in line with the realities. Yeah. That's very important. If you look at the Gambian education system, fine, we have fine policies. We are you, we are very good at you know, coming up with policies, but implementation is a problem. Yeah. Starting at the Gambian college, how do you expect a teacher to impart knowledge in a child mm. who has never been happy throughout his studies? 
until the teacher, I mean, a yeah. teacher who, during his training, he has been undergoing a lot of stresses until he becomes too much stress. Cool. And you post him to an upper, uh, you know, a rural area where some of the amenities, some of the facilities that need to provide, that need to at least bring solace into his heart are not there. Cool. You expect that person and the materials at school. I remember when I was at school, they would tell me, improvise. <laughs> How can I improvise an exercise book? <laughs> How can I do that? Sometimes mm -hmm. what I do is now, I dip into my pocket and buy books for children. Sometimes you realize a particular child is, you know, is intellectually okay or what, but what to put in the stomach comes to school hungrily. Sure. The person will not, those who are not very shy will not tell you, but some who are like me don't they mind. If they're bold, they will say. Dry me yeah. today, I'm hungry. Yeah, so yeah. If I, you know, all these things need to be taken care of. Policies are nice, but what obtains in reality sure. needs to be looked into. And as a former teacher, I can tell you that certainly there are a lot of issues that needs to be addressed, that need to be addressed as far as quality education is concerned in this country. Thanks for that, Mustafa. Yeah. And, uh, you know, as sometimes I always give a kind of passing uh, comment on this sort of thing. And I think, you know, um, this needs to be, we keep talking about a wake-up call, a wake-up call. You know, how many wake-up calls do you need before we actually get up out of bed and do something? And honestly, if we do not take education seriously, 5, 10, 15 years from now, the children that we let down will come back and they will be very, very angry with us that we did nothing to help them. So please, let's treat education with the seriousness it deserves. Now, on to something completely different, but again, something that I hope Mustafa is into. Football. I'll say no more, just watch this. Ethiopia revived their hopes of qualification with a comfortable and well-deserved 3-0 victory over Niger at the Addis Ababa National Stadium on Tuesday. This result sees Ethiopia move to six points and onto third spot in the group, while Côte d'Ivoire and Madagascar retained first and second place after playing out a one-all draw in Antananarivo. Madagascar seemed determined to show that their amazing run to the quarterfinals of the last AFCON was no fluke. So, lots still to play for in almost every group, and the next round of matches will resume and conclude in March 2021. Lots still to play for, including, of course... Gambia, Gabon group, Mustafa, have you been following the machinations both on and off pitch uh, around Gambia, Gabon? Yeah, it may be surprising to some people, but I do follow football. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I've been following just this uh, morning. Yeah. And I have uh, two of my colleagues who are in uh, GFF communications. These are people that I communicate a lot right, with and right. they give me a lot of updates, whereas uh, where I am not able to watch it. So give me updates or send me links to watch it at my free time. I love one thing yes, yes. that I watched yeah, this yeah. morning yeah. You know, on CGTN, yes. and then the headline reads, Gambia returns to football. Ah, ah, <laughs> ah, ah, indeed, <laughs> exactly. After all the nonsense about what happened at the airport and so on, yes, yes. it was finally, it was, a, it was football. But also, I mean, uh, what has happened with beating Gabon is that it has raised hopes uh, amongst Gambian, um, not just the footballers, but amongst the fans and, and, and nationwide. Surely that finally Gambia might make it to an AFCON. Uh, are you looking forward to that? Yes, I am looking forward to that. And I believe it's this time that he will qualify. Oh. Yes. Gambia, if you look at Gambia, when I was younger, each time we watch football, we usually beat him. Yeah. But now, looking at this qualifying trend, yeah. qualifying matches, we were able to defeat you know, Angola, three or three That's goals right. to one. Yeah, yeah, quite, yes. DR Congo, DR Congo. we drew 2-2. Two, two. Yeah. Gabon, we went to Gabon, we were defeated 2-1. And they came, came here, back. we defeated them. And that has ignited hopes in a lot of sure. people. Even all men in the street are asking, yeah. we've heard that Gambia has won, but it seems this year is our year. Yeah. They will tell you. So that has given me the hope and many people sure. that this year, we need only four points to go. Well, well this is it. <laughs> and, and also, I think what has happened, what has uh, heartened Gambians is that you know small nations are doing particularly well. Madagascar, well, small nations in terms of football. Sure. I mean, Maz Madagascar has a population of 26 million, but mm. going to the Afcon the last time was their first, and now they they're there, right behind Ivory Coast. They're on the same number of points as Ivory Coast, and then you have the Comoros, mm. joint top with Egypt. Cape yeah, Verde, uh, Cape, Cape Verde, of course. Yeah. You know, uh, um, you know, a population of 580,000 Cape Verde, and yet they they expect to go every time. Um, so, you know, it, it, is this something that should encourage us as, 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 as Gambians? And, and, you know, having seen, you know, that they beat, you know, what was the top seed in the group, Gabon, and, and deservedly beat them, uh, surely uh, we have a lot to look forward to. 
Yeah, this is something that has inspired, like say, ignited hopes. A lot of Gambians mm -hmm. are football enthusiasts, but sadly, if you look at it now, mm. we, we cheer more of you know, international foreign football than sure. our football. But now the time has come for us. Though. I tell you, believe me, if this match was not played close doors, mm. behind closed doors, you would have seen probably the oh. most watch game. Uh, yeah, Myself, I was ready to go. Yeah, I, yes. I think all of us were ready yes. to go. Yeah. So and then this, uh, that has gone a long way to tell people that Gambians are ready to embrace or Gambians are ready to support their football. Gambian players, those who were playing before have been playing. Sure. But now we've got the chance to qualify. Yeah. And this, if we qualify, it's going to, like the, 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 the TV station says or news says, Gam football has returned to Gambia. Gambia. Football was one time in the Gambia when I was young in the time oh, of you know, Jato, Osman, and the yeah, others. Yeah, but some, for some reasons now we've been down all along. And now we've gone up. I think it's going to be good. It's going to be good, yeah. yeah. And uh, I have to agree with Mustafa there. I think uh, what we have here is a really good crop of uh, good players who are playing at decent levels internationally. And I think that has definitely helped uh, the Scorpions. So. Um, we wish them well and we wish them luck and we're sure they will do it and finally make it to AFCON in Cameroon. And now we'll take another quick commercial break and when we come back we'll have three more stories for you. So don't go away. <laughs> Welcome back after that uh, brief commercial break. And uh, if you're just joining us, then gosh, you've missed seven stories already. But don't switch off. Three more to go, and they're really good ones, including this one. Smoking ban, a public smoking ban. Have a look at this clip, and you'll probably smile along with me. But join us. Have a look. The Gambia has a long history in tobacco control, but as with many laws on the status book, as much less impressive record of enforcement. In fact, the first law prohibiting smoking in public place, the Public Smoking Act was passed in 1998, but was not enforced until October 2010. As well as the Public Smoking Act, the Advertisement Law banning the advertisement, promotion and sponsorship of all tobacco products was passed in 2003. In June 2007, the Gambia ratified the World Health Organization Framework Convention on Tobacco Control and went further to issue a directive on packaging and labeling of all tobacco products entering the country. And uh, you heard my colleague Babu Karsi uh, relating that story. And uh, there seems to be a pattern developing here. He mentioned that we have these laws on the statute books, but they're not enforced. Uh, we talked about it when we were talking about road traffic. We talked about it when we were talking about education. Uh, we pass all these laws and we make you know, all these bills go through parliament, lots of debates, but then it's either implementation or enforcement is lacking. Smoking ban, are you confident that a public smoking ban can and will be enforced? If we can't even be bothered to stop at traffic lights. <laughs> 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 yeah, so this is a matter uh, of opinion, you uh, know, uh, I hope people uh, understand that. Sure. I am definitely not convinced yeah. that uh, it will be implemented and uh, forced. Sure. I mean, I'm definitely, uh, I look uh, forward to it. Yes. It's not impossible, yeah. but I'm not convinced based on the, the following reasons. Sure. We have anti littering laws in the country. We have a law against the use of plastic bag. Yeah. You know, you go to the market, you see in the street, in the, uh, the market, and everywhere people using plastic bag. Sure. And it's outlawed in this country. Look at anti littering laws, you find people. Sometimes when I go on my morning jogs or exercise at the forest, it's a, dump, a hidden dumping ground yeah, for yeah. some people. I don't know if the environmental agents are aware of it, the NEA, but if they take a stroll at the forest, you see s in some part of the forest are being used mm. for, 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 for dumping and they are not designated sites for that. Sure. So when those laws have come into force or have come into being before this one and they are not being implemented, I'm not sure this will be enforced. 
-hmm. It could be. That is not impossible. But from my own perspective, I am not confident yeah. in response to the question. Yes, but right. um, the reason you and I are both smiling is because uh, <laughs> I think neither Mustafa nor myself uh, are that confident that this will be enforced. But we hope it will be. And what we didn't show was that um, the police officer who was making the announcement said that even though they've been they're passing what some people would see as draconian, they're not making provisions for smoking areas in any of the places where they're banning smoking. So I think this one is going to be very, very difficult to enforce. But <laughs> thanks for that. We've got two more stories to go. And uh, earlier in the program, I said there were a couple of stories that kind of shocked me. I think this is the one that shocked me the most. And um, just to show that not every story we do is about the Gambia necessarily. I mean, we've done stuff about the American elections and so on. This one is not about the Gambia, but it's another part of Africa, East Africa. Have a look at this. Robert Kiagulani, otherwise known as Bobby Wine, and a prospective Ugandan presidential candidate, has been released on bail after being charged with spreading coronavirus. This is one of several arrests of the music star politician. This time, the charge is that the singer held a large rally this week, thereby breaching coronavirus rules. Human rights groups say the virus charge is a pretext to suppress political opposition. Supporters of the star took to the streets in protest at his arrest and, by Friday, 28 people were reported killed in clashes with police and what appeared to be armed men in plain clothes. Robert Kiagulani is among 11 candidates challenging President Yuri Museveni, who came to power 34 years ago when Kiagulani was four years old. Human Rights Watch says it is clear that the Ugandan authorities are using COVID-19 guidelines to repress opposition and that the governing party has held large events ahead of the elections on 14 January 2021. Uh, there you had my colleague Babu Karsisi talking about uh, Robert Chagulani, uh, better known as Bobby Wine. Uh, he's a big music star in the sort of uh, reggae raga scene of mm. East Africa. Uh, but now uh, more commonly known around the world, Bobby Wine as a potential uh, presidential candidate. Uh, that story mentioned the fact that he's been ar arrested multiple times. I think we make it eight times that he's been arrested, charged, released. Uh, should somebody like Museveni, who's been in power for 35 years, be worried about somebody like Robert Chagulani? He shouldn't be worried about <laughs> <laughs> He shouldn't be worried about Like I said, you know, uh, he's part of the African leaders who, or leaders who, who think that they, are, they will be in power for life. And as a result, yeah. they are not comfortable with whosoever yeah. tries to challenge them. This is not the, this might be the latest, but it's not the only move to, to you know, by the government of, yes. of uh, his country. Yeah, you know, Museveni, yeah. particularly him. Yeah, I mean, this he is not the first He even move. changed his birth certificate. Yeah. He, he made himself three years younger than everybody thought he was, say, yeah. and said they'd made a mistake with his birth certificate. It's not a mistake, it's a <laughs> deliberate yeah. kind of a mistake now. I could, but this is not the first move by the URMS Museveni's government mm. in order to stop Bobby Wine sure, excelling yeah. from achieving his political goals. Yes. Uh, the last time I have heard on the, uh, an announcement that uh, you know the government, the government has made an announcement that that no media house in the country should yeah. host people of his with political the, with party the red, with their red, red hat. hats. Yes. That's a, that is that is that is an obstacle. That uh, that is a restriction of their freedom. That's right. Of, you know, I mean, they made a <laughs> ridiculous announcement saying that the red hat was uh, reserved for the military. And yet when they were challenged as to, can you show us where it says, I, first of all, the military don't wear the red hat. Yes. And, and secondly, they asked them to show, to produce where it says that the military are the only one that can wear the red beret. They couldn't produce it. They, they would not have any backing for that. Yeah. They did it and after public outcry, they regretted it. They sure. had no backing. But yeah, this right. is something that all, like I said, you know, the, the, the analysis of the move is to make sure that Bobby Wine doesn't achieve sure. presidency. Sure. Yes, and then Musa Bini is being very mindful now yeah. because you know too much of you know attacking someone at least who has a bit of followers mm -mm. makes you lose your credentials. Sure, sure. Makes sure. you lose your reputation. At the end of the day, what it could lead to is you losing power. Is the power, yes. and and they, none of them seem to um, learn that particular lesson. Yeah. Um, so yeah, but uh, thank you for that one. Yeah. And now uh, this one again. Um, there's a reason why I chose this particular story. Um, and have a look at it, and uh, when you see it, we'll delve into why exactly I chose this story. All will make sense. Have a look. 
gender-based violence. Socioeconomic statistics are essential to understanding and using economic information for planning and policy designs. Macroeconomic decision making that is grounded in data and statistics offers the better path to ensuring strong economic growth and job creation, which in turn lift the people out of poverty and increase their productivity. Now that was a clip commemorating stroke celebrating world uh, or African Statistics Day, Statistics Day yeah. uh, 2020. And uh, the reason we chose it and the reason we did a story about it is because it says quite clearly that it wants to celebrate uh, the importance of statistics in socioeconomic life and development. Now, uh, you and I have been talking about things. Um, uh, when you try and get statistics on a number of things here in the Gambia, you struggle. How can you develop if you don't have the statistics about what it is you want to develop? Again, are we serious about this? Uh, yeah, yeah, let's take it this <laughs> way around. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, people sometimes take, uh, s underestimate the importance of statistics, yeah, of but it's very important. Statistics enable you to determine the quantity of something that you want to probably deal with. For instance, now, in order for you to make quality decisions you have to get statistics on something that you want to make decisions for take for example we're talking about education sure yes you want to build school in a particular area you have Indeed. education policy yes. so you need to know whether the type of you know whether the, the enrollment it's the area is going to meet the enrollment sure. standards of the school so how do you get to know about a school statistics sure you want to do more develop uh, develop you want to build a hospital in a particular area you need to force upon whether that is need based on the health uh, you know sure. the, the health sector standards that the number of people living there and the number of cases that are referred to probably the nearest hospital i think time, time has defeated us yeah. <laughs> and you know i always end up saying on this program time <laughs> is our enemy mm -hmm. and i'm sorry to cut mustafa there in mid-sentence but we really do have to end it there uh, mustafa it's been a pleasure having you and as i said finally we met Sure. And, and thank you for some insightful comments there and some very, very pungent uh, comments. So once again, thank you for coming on the show. You're welcome. It's a pleasure of being part of it. It's part of national development. Thank <laughs> you. Yes, thank sir. you. And to our viewers, I always say thank you for watching. You could be doing something else, but you're choosing to watch this. So we're very grateful and keep on watching. And for those of you who contacted me during the week, really, really appreciate it. Thank you and join us again next week. Goodbye for now.